Welcome back to the lab. This is going to be fantastic. We're actually going to build our electronic load. We're going to build the first electronic load. Well, because we're probably going to build more than one, but that doesn't make me any less excited to dive in. For those that pay close attention to the channel, you may have seen us, well, building this in our live stream. You might have seen some of our live stream content from a few weeks back. And that's right, if you wanna be the first in line to see what's happening, if you wanna see what we're doing, what's coming up next in these videos, make sure you get subscribed so you get notified about those live streams. For those that already caught the live stream, there's still plenty of good that we're going to talk about today. We're gonna to walk through everything in a condensed format. We're gonna be add some commentary and some retrospective, some perspective on what happened. But that's enough chatter, let's do this. Let's dive in. Okay, so I'm gonna break this down into a few sections, uh, three big ones, really. We're gonna start with the design defects, we're gonna follow that with assembly defects, and then our overall impressions, our, our first impressions from working with this design. Okay, the design defects. Um, actually, there were less here than I expected with our first prototype. Remember, our mission at EE for Everyone is to continue my own education through pursuing projects that challenge me, doing things that I've never done before in a way that I've never tried before. And uh, hopefully that inspires you to do the same. To frame this up for years and years, I've been boldly declaring, oh yeah, of course you can build a PID compensator with an op amp. Yeah, voltage control's fine, no need for trans impedance amplifiers, and I've never actually built one in real life. All my PID loops have been running in software or using some higher level of integration on hardware, and why? Why would I do that to myself? It's because I see a big risk of noise coupling into the nets of these control signals. I see a big opportunity for noise to couple into these control signals and component tolerances to stack up in a way that's not very good or limitations to start chipping away at the performance of the system. In other words, I see a lot of opportunity for a discrete PID compensator like this to no longer work or not function as intended, even if it was designed and implemented well. And so when I'm designing something for someone else, it just, it never makes sense. It's never the right move. Um, but now that we've got one in the shop and I, I learn more about it, maybe that perspective will change and maybe someday I'll need to do this in hardware and it's good to explore these concepts in reality. Yeah, likewise, I've never really used a SPI ADC or DAC before. I didn't really know what to expect with regards to accuracy compared to what I'm used to when they're integrated into a micro. Um, yeah, I really didn't know if the accuracy would be terrible or the bandwidth limitations of the SPI bus or sharing that SPI bus between multiple components would turn out to be an issue. Making a stable analog reference on the, the load reference, technically electrically floating side just capacitively coupled to earth ground I didn't know if that would be terrible or if that would work okay. There's a lot of unknowns for me in this design. There's a lot of things that I wasn't sure about. And those are the types of things that can make a design go off the rails, but I'm, I'm getting off track. I'm getting off track, so let's reel this in. All this to say, I had some concerns. I had some valid concerns. I had some real concerns about the way that we implemented this project because that was the point of this project. More testing required on a few things, but broad strokes, I think that the design works very well considering how confident I was on day one. Specifically, one area that we ran into a few of the issues that I expected was the buffer stage, the discrete BJT buffer. And when we were working with this buffer stage, Basically what we saw is the FETs were, f or not the FETs, the BJTs were failing in something that looked like a short circuit. And there's a little more testing required there. Need to figure out why I need to drive that to root cause, but uh, didn't work quite out of the gate. I think we can make it work for our design with a couple lifted pads, tweaked components, maybe a blue wire. That'll be all right. Uh, the next problem uh, was about the current ADC. Did a great job of designing this for accuracy and normal operation, 
but forgot about all those teensy tiny brief moments where tens or hundreds of amps may be surging through our FET and these sense resistors producing large voltages and perhaps damaging an ADC. So uh, what my plan is for these prototypes as we build them and uh, work through this is to replace the zero ohms with a 1K and hopefully that won't affect our accuracy too much. We'll need to do a little more testing there. Overall, not bad news. I think that's something we can work with. Um, yeah, it's never easy to talk about failings or missteps. So likewise, that wasn't, but I think the rest of this will be pretty easy going. The assembly from JLPCB was great as usual. The parts they used were acceptable quality. They seemed to be genuine parts and good parts, and the turn time was crazy fast. I'm noticing their prices slowly creep up over time, but that's a little understandable because they're creeping up towards some of their competitors like Seed Studio or other similar services I've seen in the past. So it's not surprising that they were running some pro promotional rates to get people talking about JLCPCB's SMT service, and now that people are learning about it and they're seeing more orders come in, well, they're probably dialing that back because they're doing good work, and I'm not against paying a fair price for good work. Like, they are doing good work and they deserve to be paid for it, so I'm not upset that the prices are increasing because I'd rather see the prices increase than the quality go down. Uh, not sponsored, never sponsored, well, Maybe not, never, but not sponsored. And uh, I will tell you if we ever are. That's just my personal opinion, hot off the presses, given the larger sum of money I needed to pay for this prototype compared to some others and the quality that was delivered. They weren't perfect. And if I'm allowed to dream, if I'm allowed to make a couple requests for how I'd like to see their SMT service or their service offering in general grow, they'd be this. I would want them to open up the SMT service for PCBs with more than four layers because I keep hitting my head against the four layer ceiling and that's annoying. When I'm like, oh, all I wanna do is implement this board, but we've got 15 voltage rails and I just can't get them across the board well. That was a big problem with the UPS project, especially on the main board. And uh, I mean, we were fighting that again today, but no matter how many layers you have, you'll always want more. So I understand it's hard. Maybe, maybe just maybe, if I could have my second thing, that would be, can we get some colors that aren't green? like? I know it saves cost. I know it makes it easier and cheaper. But come on, man, it's cool. It's like black or, man, you can still limit it to less than, you know, all of your colors, but yeah. Even charge me more for the cool colors, but I, it's okay, it's okay. I, I understand. I'd rather them keep the service the way that it is to keep cost down than try all these crazy, wacky things that don't really matter and detract from the good that is in their service. Like, I don't want good to get, I don't want great to get in the way of good for JLC PCB because they are doing good. It's not perfect. I don't even think it's something that I would want to ship in an end product. But for prototyping, for engineering, for students, for learning, there is a place where that service will do good in this world and I want it to keep existing. Check it out if you never have and let me know what you think about it. Let us know in the comments if you've used JLC PCB's SMT service and have thoughts. But yeah, um, once we got the boards in hand, it was pretty easy to solder once we got the right tools in the shop. It was a struggle to solder the 0.5 millimeter SMT uh, VSSOPs, I think it was, I think that's what it was. But anyways, the 0.5 millimeter pitch parts that didn't have flux on the leads because I didn't have any flux and then didn't have the hot air gun and we got the hot air gun and some flux and it got a lot easier. So there's something to be said for having the right tools for the job. Speaking of the right tools for the job, uh, there might be a Proto 2 coming up. So make sure to get subscribed and uh, sign up for notifications so that you're notified because it is best to be prepared and subscribed when we <laughs> get there. I think this Proto 2 is going to be sweet. So make sure you don't miss it. Anyways, um, overall impressions then, broad strokes on the design, takeaways. What are my thoughts? You know, I just got the parts in, just barely starting to figure out what this design can do. What are my feelings? 
The heat sink's too small. The fan's too small. The cooling isn't enough to get this design to where I want it to be. The FET can handle about 1,000 watts, and I noticed the heatsink getting hot in my very limited testing. Like, ugh, hot. Like, not, oh, that's a little, like, I can't hold my hand on that hot. And I don't have numbers wrapped around exactly where this design is going to land, but I know that it got hot. Too hot. It got hot enough that we're not going to be able to hit the power target that I wanted with this prototype. Call out for one of our lovely viewers, Fix Daily, for suggesting that we try out CPU coolers. It was a perfectly timed suggestion where I was lamenting the fact that the cooling was insufficient and just thinking about the massive extruded aluminum heatsink we'd need to really get the heat out of this thing and just thinking, man, if we could get some heat pipes, maybe some water cooling, I don't really know what it's going to take. And then he's like, hey, you know, you could just use a standard CPU cooler. And I was like, yeah, we could just use a standard CPU cooler. So I think we're going to give that a shot because you've got all these great coolers. Some of them are cheap without heat pipes. Some of them have heat pipes and fin stacks. Some of them have more and less and it's bigger and smaller. And then you get the water cooling and hey, you know, you've just got a lot of great cooling solutions that you can just and they're made for higher power. So this just might work out. All that to say, one way or another, I'm going to get a thousand watts out of one of these FETs. Like, that's where I'm at. Well, I'm pleased as punch. We built our first prototype and it didn't explode. Success! If you like this video and you can't wait for more, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, or leaving a comment down below. Coming up soon, we'll be talking about the GUI and the PC control application prototyping. I can't wait to tell you all about it because this project is about to get awesome. It's cool already, but it's about to get awesome. If you want to support the channel, consider checking out the Patreon page linked in the description. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you. Yes, thank you to everyone who has decided to become a member. You are a huge part of keeping this channel rolling. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thank you for watching EE for everyone. Thank you for staying till the end. Bye.